All right, so what are microplots? So I'm sure quite a few of you have already seen the papers from uh, Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kell and their colleagues, and have seen some of these really beautiful uh, images with the, the green clumpy microclots over here. Um, so what microclots are is they are clumps of misfolded fibrin, and they can range in size from one to 200 microns in diameter. And just for reference, a human hair is about 70 microns in diameter. So these guys, these clumps can get pretty big. Um, and essentially, they have found in some studies that Dr. Pretorius and colleagues did that when you kind of break down or digest these clots, so you use an enzyme to kind of degrade them, they find um, basically that it contains some other molecules. Like you can find certain like clotting proteins and you can also find uh, autoantibodies and things like that kind of lumped into these. So you can almost think of them as kind of like almost like a fibrin version of a hairball and it's kind of collected a bunch of junk in there. Um, and, you know, something that's interesting about this, and we'll talk about this in more detail in the next slide, but um, spike protein uh, may actually lead to this kind of misfolding of fibrin. Uh, into these clumps. And when you have something that's a misfolded protein, meaning it's folded in a way uh, that you kind of shouldn't fold it, it's not the normal way it folds, um, that is called an amyloid. So amyloid basically means kind of like misfolded. Um, and basically when the spike protein binds to a portion of fibrin that it causes this kind of misfolding pattern, the misfolding kind of triggers the misfolding of like the next one and the next one and the next one. It's kind of like a domino effect. And um, it makes these clumps more resistant to being broken down or degraded. And it can make them possibly more thrombogenic, meaning more likely to, to trigger um, like blood to clot. Um, so from the studies from Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kell and colleagues, um, they found that long COVID patients appear to have larger a larger number and larger size of these microclots compared to healthy controls. Um, they also looked at patients with ME-CFS who also, they did find microclots, but they didn't have as many and they didn't seem to be as big as those with long COVID. Now, to be fair, also, microclots do appear in COVID-recovered individuals and also in diabetics and people with Alzheimer's and a couple other conditions that they have studied. So Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kell, they've been working on looking at these um, fibrin microclots in many diseases prior to long COVID, prior to the pandemic. They've been working on this for probably close to a decade, I believe. And so there was a, um, a preprint study that came out of UC San Francisco. And basically when you mixed spike um, into human plasma um, and you looked at what fibrin mesh formed, this is like normal human plasma without spike protein. You can see the fiber structure here is really kind of nice and smooth. Fibers are bigger. They don't seem to be lumpy and sticky. Um, and then you've got human plasma plus spike protein over here on the right. And this is under an electron microscope. And you can see the strands are really kind of thin and they're more branched and they've got kind of like these bumps and lumps on them. So basically the spike protein seems to cause this sort of abnormal different folding pattern or different uh, strand pattern of fibrin. And the other thing too that this paper found was that spike protein was binding to a specific area on fibrin that plasmin, which is the, like the enzyme that's supposed to kind of chew up and break down the fibrin, it spike binds to the area where plasmin is supposed to bind. So essentially it can possibly block plasmin from binding to and breaking down clumps of this kind of spaghetti looking mesh of fibrin. So this was also seen by Dr. Pretorius and colleagues in this paper here, persistent clotting protein pathology in long COVID. Um, and essentially what they did was they looked at diabetics, they took blood from diabetics and also from long COVID patients. And essentially what they did was they got the microclots and then they spun them down so that they kind of formed a, what's called a pellet. So when you spin something in a centrifuge, the heaviest things start to collect in the very tip at the very, very bottom. And they call that a pellet. And then what they did was they added enzyme 
to this to try and degrade and digest that pellet of microclots. And um, what they found was that in the diabetics, the diabetics had, had quite a few microclots, but they were able to digest those microclots from diabetics with just one application of this enzyme called trypsin. But the long COVID microclot pellet, it took two separate digestions to break them down. So they were harder to break down than in the diabetics. And um, that's kind of consistent with what the UCSF preprint showed, that spike protein binding to parts of fibrin makes it harder for it to get broken down. Um, now, the other thing they did was after they digested that pellet of microclots, they um, basically ran an assay on it where they did proteomics, which is essentially you're, you're looking at a whole range of different proteins in the solution that has now been digested. So essentially, you've kind of used an enzyme to break apart that sort of spaghetti looking mesh. And now you're trying to see, okay, well, what got released from that? What was in there? And so they, they found the alpha-2 antiplasmin and serum amyloid A, there was quite a bit of that trapped inside those microclots. Additionally, they also found some autoantibodies too. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about platelet activation. Um, so platelets are these really tiny little cells and essentially what they do is they help with blood clotting. Um, now platelet hyperactivation has been seen alongside microclotting in long COVID patients. But um, to be fair, platelets activate in response to infection and inflammation not normally. That's normal. They tend to be very, uh, you know, as I heard from a hematologist who works with platelets specifically, platelets can activate if you look at them wrong. They're very sensitive cells. Like they kind of go off at the slightest thing. Um, and so um, it's pretty normal to have an activated platelet res response if you have an infection. However, having platelet activation persist for a very long time after the resolution of that in acute infection or inflammation, that is not normal. So, but I would say that we don't have, or at least I'm not aware of like great data showing how long are platelets typically activated for after you get, let's say influenza or you get the common cold or let's say, you know, any other kind of infection. How long does it take for those platelets to normalize? Is it like two weeks? Is it a month? Is it, you know, three months? But, you know, from what Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kell were seeing and also Dr. Yeager in Germany, they're seeing platelets that are hyperactivated in people many, many months after they had COVID, if they have long COVID. So um, the other thing that can happen too, though, is that platelets, because they're so easy to activate, um, they can also activate during shipment of blood. So most of the platelet studies that have been done so far are on blood that was drawn on site. So they draw the blood and they basically process it kind of right there or within two hours. They don't really like ship it and then try to look at the platelets because shipping might, depending on how it's done, it may activate the platelets and cause it to look activated when it may not have been. Um, so right now, currently, it's difficult to assess platelet activation routinely for clinical purposes because the tests for that are not super available. And part of that is because the shipping involved can activate them. And so um, right now, there's a um, there's like a platelet aggregometer that's like a standalone little um, piece of equipment that you can get. And that's a point of care device. So meaning it's kind of like Imagine like a glucose testing where you prick your finger and you kind of test it and you test it and it gives you an answer right there on the spot. Um, that's sort of what this device is like, except it's a lot more expensive. Um, so right now it's a little hard to test platelet activation clinically in most cases. 